So I'm just going to log out and come back. It's okay. Hello, it's everybody. So I'm just your names. Yeah, it's kind of fun. You get to see faces. Yes, absolutely. Angela, Allison, Marlene, Amanda. Paul Hirsch. Yeah. Hirsch is always here. I don't think he's ever missed one. Catherine Iverson. I do know Eve Valera is joining us a little bit late. She has a meeting with Grant Iverson. So welcome everybody. Thank you for choosing with all the other things going on and the world reopening to join us today on the Zoom call. Oh, Eve is there. Uh, Hi. Welcome Eve. Hi oh. Eve. Hi Amanda. Hi, hey everybody. Kathy. See, I told you it's going to be fun. It was Kate it's, Iverson. Yep. Hi, Kate. Um, Hi, welcome to the April, is it April? Yeah, April task force call. I think this is called 25. And I just wanted to check in with um, the leadership to double check whether they had any news. Kate Iverson, do you have any news you'd like to share? I think you're muted. All right, um, give me just a minute to, to get my bearings. I'm trying to figure out what's going on with my background. So at the top of my head, no, I don't have anything, um, any news to share right now, but let me think on it and I'll get back to you if I do. Okay, thank you. One moment. Angela, do you have news you'd like to share? Yes, I do actually. Um, I want to share that Lynn Hogg, who is a member of our lab and a part of this task force, uh, received a Change Maker Award from oh. Large of Canada. Yay! So anyway, um, there was, I'll send out a link um, about this, and she was also featured on uh, um, sort of like a 60 Minutes type show in Canada around IPV and traumatic brain injury. And I know that uh, Paul on the line too was also in that, or your uh, Paul and Karen. So um, anyway. So. Money? Does it come with money? <laughs> <laughs> no, just a lot of prestige. That's all right. <laughs> and I guess what's significant is Neurological Health Charities of Canada is um, consumer based. Like it's, you know, it's the charities that represent persons with neurological conditions. So I think that's especially meaningful. Totally meaningful. I just also want money for people too. <laughs> It's the things that are important in life. <laughs> well, not that I'm aware of. Maybe there is, but I don't think so. So, Just re reminding those that fund that uh, they're all interested in domestic violence right now. It's, it's post-COVID popular, so let's fund it. Um, Rachel, thank you. Oh, Angela, is there anything else you have to share? Thank you. And then this Thursday, you have a task force meeting. We do. Uh, that's next uh, week. Uh, it's, it's on the first Thursday um, of May at 2 p.m. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, Rachel, what news do you have? Hi, everybody. Sorry, I'm busy making new friends in the chat box. So I want all of our new friends who are in the chat box to tell us a little bit more about themselves, which is exciting that you're joining us for the first time. So um, those of you here for the first time, welcome. My name is Rachel Ramirez. I'm from the Ohio Domestic Violence Network. Um, in Ohio and um, have created a center on partner inflicted brain injury here. Um, I've been super, super busy doing a lot of trainings and actually we have a training later on this afternoon with several task force members, including Hirsch, who I think is on and Kate Lawler from Chicago and Dorothy from Chicago um, later on this afternoon. Um, I'll also be printing, presenting at the grand irony of the virtual Hawaii conference, which I just think is a crock. Um, so I was saying it's called the Institute on Violence, Abuse and Trauma has a virtual conference in Hawaii on Hawaiian time, which is interesting. Um, and I will be doing a, a three hour session there and presenting a couple of different things this week on that. So um, thank you all for joining us. Really excited to hear from Kathy today. Um, really excited for all the new people that are joining us. So I'll be over there chatting with you all in the chat, chat box. Um, but thanks for being here. 
Thank you, Rachel. Yes, this was the year that I had never done the Hawaiian one. It just for a, a little nonprofit, it sounded pretty uh, extravagant. But then I started the last couple of years watching who was speaking and what was going on there. So I had my miles saved. So ne next year, Hawaii. There we go. There we go. Yep. Um, and then let's see who uh, Eve. Hi, Eve. Do you have any news for us? Uh, I don't think so. Nothing, nothing new and exciting. Um, but I'm super excited to see Kathy <laughs> and all the new people. It's always nice having new people here. That's very cool. Um, so, um, and we finally got Kathy on. We've tried to get her, and she's just so busy she can never make it. My goodness. I guess that's what happens when you're rich and famous, or just famous. I don't know. But not at all. Uh, her, <laughs> Hirsch can commiserate with me because I'm moving. I'm in the, I was telling mm -hmm. uh, Catherine before that I'm in the process of moving. So as soon as I get off the call with this, I'm doing the walkthrough on my new house. And then Thursday is my closing. So I'm living amid boxes, which is kind of crazy. And I, I want to apologize in advance because the universe works in strange ways. So today is the day that they decided to repair the road in front of my house. So you may, you may hear lots of noise and some guys in the street screaming. Um, we'll try to ignore them. No way. Well, uh, just, bef just before we start with Kathy, does anybody else have any announcement that they'd like to tell the group? Good. All right. Well, if something comes up, we'll leave to save a little time at the end. So, Kathy, I'd like you to welcome you to our group today. Hi, everybody. Um, so, Catherine told me that I should start out with talking about where I started out um, in, in the field. And my first job after I got my master's degree way back when, when I'm sure many of you were in grade school, was at United Cerebral Palsy. And at that location, we did some evaluations on people who had head injuries and then mental health issues and the treatment outcomes for those, those individuals. So I was at United Cerebral Palsy for about six years. And then I decided to go for my doctorate and I wanted to go into the field of domestic violence and adult survivors of sexual abuse. So I started working in um, victims agencies and domestic violence shelters and did a whole range of different kinds of jobs in those uh, particular agencies. And in those days, it was really grassroots. So professionals were looked at with some suspicion, like, are you trying to medicalize us? And um, in fact, one of the shelters that I worked in didn't want us to di diagnose the women, the residents with PTSD because that was really medicalizing them. Um, so I had the position of, of a counselor, therapist, a supervisor, and then administrator. So I, I worked in a couple of different capacities. It really gave me some interesting insight in how the shelters themselves worked and then some of the difficulties that the residents themselves had. And I saw a lot of women discharged because they couldn't obey the rules. Um, they just couldn't conform to the rules. That was my first kind of heads up, like what's going on with that? Could, I ask, it, you, could I ask you a question though? So, so had professionals come in and mucked around with the system? Is there some more history there we should know about that distrust of the professional had they come in and like in other areas you know yeah so when when i so I, I went and i got my doctorate in the meantime while i was at the shelters and I, I was still okay because they knew me they knew me in the before time i i was recognized as one of them um and then i did a postdoc and the postdoc that i did was because they wanted in that particular um, um, program, it was Dan O'Leary's program, he wanted a social worker who had a PhD or a doctorate and could get entree into the shelters because there was a lot of suspicion about what professionals were doing. They were very fearful 
that we would medicalize the whole situation and therefore then blame the woman, blame the woman for what was happening. Most of the agencies in the, in the very, the late eighties and the early nineties were grassroots organizations. So I, I can tell you where, where I did my first study, that director was a bank teller who had been abused and then decided to open up her own shelter. And when they had a resident who graduated from the shelter, she hired them back as workers within the shelter. So it was a very um, self-help grassroots type of organization throughout all the shelters, throughout all, all of the shelters. And then it started to turn, turn over. And I, I could tell you 20 years later, when I did not work in that shelter anymore, I was on the board. And what we did was we started to reorganize and hire people who had at, at a minimum of two years college education. And of course we tried to increase the salaries at the same time. So very community grassroots um, minded type of thing. Was the fear that there would be a diagnosis label placed on and then uh, the, the women could lose their children? Was it, was mm -hmm. it, was it that fear? That yeah. Injury? Okay. Yeah. Do you ever remember and, brain injury being mentioned at that time? Because I don't know whether it's like football. Everybody always knew it was included in football, but it just didn't make financial sense to talk about it in a larger um you know, on a pub, in a public forum? Never. Or, no. Okay. So it just wasn't considered. Okay. No, no. And I, I, in the one shelter that I, in one shelter, I was the clinical supervisor. In another shelter, I was an administrator. And then in, in the other shelter where I did my study, I was the clinician. And I would see these women come in and I would say, you know, they look exactly like the people that we see at United Cerebral Palsy. And so I decided to put together a medical form, quote unquote medical form, where I would ask them, you know, had to go to the IRB. And then I explained to my director, who fortunately for me adored me. And I said, listen, I, I, I really want to start asking these questions because it just seems like these women have head injury and yet they're getting discharged or, or they wouldn't remember to make the communal dinner or they wouldn't get back in time for the curfew, or they were fighting with each other, or they were sleeping, or they were too depressed to get out of bed. And what I started to explain to the shelter staff at that time was that the, these are signs that there's head injury. And if you start asking the question, you may get the answer. And what year and was so, that now? It's I'm of, sorry. What year was that now? I really wanted like, um, Put that so down. I did. I did my postdoc in '94 to '96, and then we published the study in '99. Uh, okay. So and it was it was like over three months. We um, we interviewed 26 women, and uh, nine of them had a head injury, and their he head injuries were horrific. You know, being run over by a car, um, their head being bashed into the dashboard. Uh, being hit in the head with a baseball bat, stuff, stuff that you're like, oh my God, how is this person still standing? And then later on, having a stroke, yep. a seizure disorder, and women, women would say to me, do you, do you think that maybe when I got hit in the head or when he hit me in the head with the baseball bat, that that's why I have a seizure disorder? And of course, I'm a, I'm a social worker, so I'd have to say I'm not a MD, and I can't say that, but it's certainly an area for investigation. Just to put the historical context, uh, 1990 was the case of the punch drunk wife, which right. was the Lancet, so that there already was a published paper out there, domestic violence, cauliflower ears, and you know, tau tangles, but nobody decided to jump on that. Well, I, I, I think I think part of it was because um, nobody read The Lancet every day. And part of it was because we didn't have the internet. Did I just say that? Oh my God. Um, well, that's culture. That's why I want to put dates in this because, you know, 
there are social workers out there that weren't born then. So, you know. <laughs> Catherine, you did not just say that. Yes, yes, because my, my children were born those years and they are now full creatures with apartments and jobs. So, right, right. So, so, but I think one of the things that you're saying about the Lancet is, is it was just sort of, people don't see women necessarily as they would say a, a man, you know, and, and it's just very different. So this was just this single person. Yeah. You know, maybe she deserved it. Who knows? It was some crazy guy. He hit her in the head and, and this happened. No, no one was thinking, oh yeah, this happens all the time. We have, you know, men who are abusing their wives all the time. It, that wasn't put on the board at all. It just didn't register at all. So it was just seen as sort of this isolated incident. So, yeah. so really that was, it was, it, it's kind of irrelevant almost that that was out there. You'd think someone might have, and if it had been a man who that article was written about, so I might have said like, why is this woman abusing this man like this? You know, what's the deal? Instead, it was just sort of a focus of, oh, well, look at this case report. Okay, you know, da da da. Um, and and, and is it interesting that she has cauliflower ears and not? Well, gee, maybe she has cauliflower exactly. ears because she's been beaten for decades. That she's been punched so often that yes. her ears are now malformed, that they look like cauliflower. Um, so no, nobody was looking, and, and Casper does a wonderful job of, of talking about how it got gendered again. Um, so- And Kelly, take, Kelly's on the line too. Uh, Kelly's with us. Uh, uh, Kelly O'Donnell and uh, Stephen Casper wrote that. Hi Kelly. I, I hey. remember seeing you last year in 2020 pre-COVID. So, so that was kind of the, the state. Um, I, so then I did the study and I, I, I thought it was the cat's meow. I was like, oh my God, this is like horrible. What, what do we do? What do we do? Um, and then again, it was like uh, way back, way, way back. And I'm not gonna tell you the year. I read in Miss Magazine that one out of four girls under the age of 18 were sexually abused. Um, and I wanted to use it. I was in a volunteer organization talking about sexual abuse. And I wanted to use that quote. And they said, no, Kat, don't use that quote. Don't use that quote. Because when you go to the PTA and you say something like that, people will go screaming out the doors and say, one out of four, oh my God, oh my God. And of course, that was way back when, and now it's two out of four. And I don't see anybody screaming and I don't see anybody panicking. And so it's the same kind of thing that we have now where we have this epidemic, it's an epidemic. These people are suffering, their children are suffering and we are still begging for money. We're still got our hand out saying, please, we need some money to address this kind of issue. Um, and it doesn't seem to rise to the level of awareness for the powers that be. Some, some places, but not as much as I would like it to be. Well, to uh, I was just gonna say that I think Canada has actually, and Angela yes. on the line, Canada's done an amazing job and I kind of Absolutely. wish we could take a lead from them because I know like Paul's like, oh yeah, we got some money or, you know, and, and like they're, we're just hoping to take advantage until the government changes. And so there are places and, and certainly I know Rachel's just like, you know, she's a tiger. So, but, but she's managed to do well in Ohio, but it's, it's very true that it's always a struggle. And when I wrote this grant, which was the first grant that was, first R01 that was ever funded on this topic, by the way, IPV or the TBI, anything imaging or whatever, when there's like tons and tons and men and athletes. When I got that, one of the, one of the reviews was, oh, well, this was done, this has been done already because it was done in men and athletes. It was just so, so basically they basically squashed it. Like you can't, you can't even respond to that. I mean, I well, said it's it, not, and I explained how it was different, but that person was never going to allow me to get through in that committee. So I had to go to another committee. But that's right. just how, that's how sad the landscape is for women um, in general. And then with this, you know, marginalized groups getting even less respect and acceptance. So, so yeah. Well, we, I, I did a study with, um, I, I'm, 
I'm doing, it's continuing a pilot with Dr. Anat Bijan in the medical school here at Stony Brook. And we submitted for an NIH grant. And one of the replies got rejected, but one of the replies was, um, and I, I, I just sat there looking at it like, are you kidding me? Are you seriously kidding me? Um, the, the reviewer said, you're, you're saying, even though there's a mountain of evidence that women don't leave because of transportation, financial difficulties, childcare, they may still care about the abuser. You're saying that head injury is the real reason that they're not leaving? Even though there's a mountain of evidence saying this other stuff. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, because it makes all those other things much more difficult to manage. You could maybe try to figure something out about transportation or your financial difficulties if you had all parts of your brain working. Um, and and I, just, I just looked at that review and I said, they, they just don't get it. No. And we said it's 16 ways to Sunday, but they, but they just don't get it. Um, so, so I think, I think there's a lot more education and, and in my career, that's how I've tried to focus it. So it's the research first, the education and training, and then the application, the practicality down in the trenches on, on what we have to do for these women. And what, what, it's just only, I think, beginning to talk about, we're beginning to talk about is the children that are exposed to this. Now, I, th I think we've come a really long way in a short amount of time. In five, mm -hmm. six, seven years, we've come, we've, we've yeah. gone, like, gone like light speed ahead. But I think we need tons more money and tons more attention to get where we need to go. And I just worry, I worry every single night about the women who are in the community and don't go into the shelters and don't go to the agencies for a support group and live in that domestic violence situation for 10, 20, 30 years. You know, we never, we never in the shelters, we never saw an old timer. We never saw anybody who was over 50 years old. And uh, we had it like once or twice. And then I would say to my student intern, you see that over there? And she'd look at the woman and I'd say, that's, that's, like, that's like an artifact. That's an unusual thing that you're looking at because that person has come in for respite. She's come in for respite and then she's gonna go back. She, she's it, been in it so long that it's very, very unusual for her to go out. And th those are the women that worry me because what are the long-term implications? Is it dementia? Is it Alzheimer's? Are we looking at CTE? And we don't know. At this point, we just don't know. Kathleen, I wanted, Kathy, I wanted to ask you the, um, the racial makeup of, the, of women in the shelter. Are we talking about white women? Are we talking about Hispanic, black? What is the makeup of the shelters when, when you I think, I think it all depends on where you are. So I can tell you um, out far out east, we have in East Hampton, we have, we have what we call, we have um, three shelters on Long Island. And on the east end, East Hampton is what we call the rich shelter. So they have lots and lots and lots of donations and goods and services because the wealthy live out there. So they donate a lot. So when um, a certain administration came in and ICE was out there looking for people, the shelter cleared and there were no Hispanic women or Latina women in that particular shelter. Then, then they got a very different cultural mix in that, in that particular shelter. Now, if you go into the western part of Suffolk County, you're going to see another different kind of cultural mix. So it so it all depends on the geographic area of where you are. And I, I have a feeling that's what's going on across the country. You know, we just, um, uh, my former doctoral student who now has a doctorate, um, we just finished a national survey. It was a small, we got a small return on it, but we looked at 100 shelters 
And again, transportation, house, safe housing, safe housing, not just housing, safe, affordable housing, um, and medical issues are a, a difficulty. They remain constant. The new piece that we found out was substance abuse issues are on the rise and legal difficulties. Now, when I did a pilot in New York State of that survey, the, the results came back and they were talking about, yeah, women, women have a problem with CPS or getting orders of protection or getting custody. I'm like, no, 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 no. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about legal difficulties, not those kind of legal difficulties, legal difficulties. So I changed the wording on that question. And in the national survey, it's increasing that women are having difficulty with probation, parole, uh, you know, law enforcement difficulties. So that begs the question, what's going on? What's happening out there? And we don't know. We don't know. We don't, I, I, I mean, the national organization does a snapshot, a census snapshot for one day in the life of all the shelters, but it's not the other kinds of things that are going on, I think, with the shelters and what's happening for the women coming into them. That's the other, amazing. the other project I wanted to talk about is is with Hirsch, and and with Cactus and MC three DB, um, and we're using the CompuBerge device to assess um, binocular, you know, vision for women and in the immediate after aftermath of a brain injury. And um, in fact, this morning before, in between the tractor outside in the street, and I was on the uh, National Health TV conference this morning with a poster, um, I was online with several people who are in Stony Brook University in our health science center, and they have a community project. So the thing that always worries me is, okay, we can identify who has a head injury. We're, we're moving on that, but then what happens afterwards? Do they get treatment? Do they get rehabilitation? Do they get speech therapy, PT, OT? What kinds of treatments do they get following up with that? So um, with Hirsch, we're gonna look at identifying acute and then post-concussive syndrome, post-concussion syndrome. And then also with Stony Brook, we're going to look at the treatment, the follow-up, and the medical students, as well as the PT, OT, speech, and social work students have to do a clinical rotation. So I'm trying to organize that so that we can get them to go into the shelter, and if not actually go into the shelter to see the residents, then to, to do an office visit that's close to the shelter. Because again, transportation is an issue. The so, other thing, go, go ahead, Kathy. No, no, go ahead. I was just going to, I have some questions, but I'm fat. Just keep talking. I love listening to you. Well, the, the other thing is uh, with, with Dr. Bishan, one of the instruments that we're using, we're doing neuropsych testing. Um, but one of the other things that we're using is an instrument called the ways of coping. And it's not, it's not a process measure of coping style, but it's, it's an actual incident. So how you're coping with that actual incident. And so we've asked women to fill out this ways of coping. And what we want to do is take a look at women who had the brain injury and IPV and women who have IPV, but no brain injury and see if their ways of coping differ. Does the brain injury actually make a difference in the way that they're responding to the, to the intimate partner violence? Um, so that, you know, looking at their confrontive coping, distancing, accepting responsibility, escape, avoidance, planful problem solving, which we know if they have a brain injury, there's going to be difficulty there, self-controlling, um, and seeking social support. So lots of different um, ways of trying to look at how women are adapting to what's going on. And, and the, the thing that I'm, I'm um, just really concerned about is what happens to those women that are not on our radar that we don't know about. 
such a such important work, Kathy. And and the Thank piece you. that I'm looking at right now is women of color, and just in the TBI world. And when a woman, if she even gets to that space where she's care is available for her? Is there a clinician that looks like her? Is there someone that has cultural competency to understand the culture from which she's coming from? You know, are all those things taken? And the, the stories I'm hearing are, are pretty discouraging. Um, we're going to address that in a full day at the uh, IBIA conference with, um, with a panel of professionals of color and women patients of color, which I'm really excited about. Um, and just, just from the standpoint of just learning, um, I'm reading a book right now called medical apartheid. And if you've never looked at it, right, right. I think it's basic, but I'm on, I'm on, I'm in the kindergarten level here. I admit it, but, um, at the kindergarten level, um, I, and I thought, I mean, like I'm a historian, I believe, but I am realizing the bias, but, you know, I'm just looking and, and as you talk, Kathy, I'm thinking if, you know, if this is the, if we're talking about the women that make it to the shelters, you know, what subset of that is of the entire iceberg and, you know, who can't even call the police to come in and who can't, you know, the different levels there. So, um, I think that's really um, um, you know awesome that the work that you're doing. Uh, anybody else? Uh, so uh, I think uh, Eve had to. Eve wrote that she had to leave. There's a lot of great stuff in the chat. Would anyone like to uh, unmic and ask Kathy a question? Or Kathy can discuss if she had all the money in the world and the power. What would you do? I always love that question. I have a question. Oh. Okay. I just, um, I was curious just about navigating care of, I think with brain injury diagnosis of women at all stages or different causes. Is the shelter capable? I mean, I assume not, you know, a program like the OPT, you know, the, the care that's the cognitive, the neuro study, how can it, I mean, I understand that it's not at the shelter, but then how can, um, these women like be able to access care and navigate care and figure out insurance with they may not have um, access to and all of that. Like, how do you see me step forward? So that so that's part of the Concubirge um, project is um, and and the Concubirge is twofold um, and and that's what I was just talking about this morning with these um, doctors over at the. Um, they're not in the one is one is in a community residence program. So he has residents that do their rotations and they have to do community service, which is why, which is why I grabbed him. And then the other gentleman is in a population health program. And so um, it's it's public health. Then they when they were talking to me, they brought on the head of uh, PT. And I already talked to a buddy of mine who's the head of speech. So what I'm trying to develop is this, okay, first we'll train the, the shelter workers and the advocates and the social work students how to use concubirge. And along with them, the other people in the clinical medical rotations, but then also then hook, hook the women up with services going forward with these medical people. My, my only uh, problem is if they say, oh yeah, the women can come to us and we'll service them. I'm like, no, 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 no. I, I, I want you to come here. I got the director to already agree uh, to provide a space, the director of the shelter to provide a space um, where they can be examined. So it's trying to move, move the earth a little bit over to there. And again, remember, remember where I started out. They were afraid, the shelters were afraid that things would become medicalized. And it's trying to get them to see, yeah, me medicine has its place. And what we wanna do is get the medical services for these women. So the other piece, the, sec the second part of this is starting to incorporate in the university curricula, 
in all of the health science professions. We have five health science professions, including dental. On Wednesdays, I'm over at the dental clinic teaching about trauma. So trying to get all the five schools in the health science center educated that, look, there's a really big problem out there. Nobody's screening, not the way they should be. And once you screen, it's kind of like, if you don't do anything about it, so what? Yeah, she has a head trauma. Yeah, she has a head trauma. So I, 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 again, if I had a magic wand, if I were God for a day, well, forget about it, if I were God for a day, but if I just had a magic wand, um, I would, first of all, create this assessment program that was on site that, that could address the needs of these women. Like, like Hirsch's program is, is like a dream come true. And their apartments and Sojourner are just fabulous, fabulous. So that's my dream world. And then the second part is, and I used to argue with my, my son-in-law that if I won the lottery, I'd take care of my family and then take the rest of my money and take a corporation and, and make a track where women could learn managerial skills, you know, how, how to increase their productivity in terms of money earning so that they could stand on their feet and not have to depend on anybody. So I, I, again, I, I just think that we have, in the, in the country, we have a different kind of idea of what women should do and not do. And we need to address that. We need to change that. I don't know if that if that was a long winded, not explanation, Kara. No, no, it was very, very helpful. It's very, um, very happy to hear what you have to say. And I think um, it's definitely true. And I see that those issues with brain injury across the board, but definitely highlighted and definitely much more um, with women, you know, who are victims of IPV, you know, for sure, especially not having the support system as well. So um, yeah. really you know, nice you're taking those initiatives. Thank you. Last week I gave a lecture and, and um, I, I was trying to explain, to explain how difficult it is to intervene. And so um, in, in one of our studies, we sent a limo to, and unfortunately for us, the only thing that they had available was a stretch limo. So they sent a stretch limo to the shelter to pick up this participant and back Back at base, we had a whole team waiting for her to come so we could do the neuropsych, the wellness check, pregnancy test, and a blood draw. So there's five of us waiting back at the base. We send the stretch limo. The stretch limo gets to the shelter, and the limo driver knocks on the door. The shelter manager opens the door, calls the participant. She comes to the door, and she says, oh, yeah, um, no, I'm not, I'm not going to go today. I have too much to do. Right. So my interns are going, oh, my God, that's like horrible. I'm like, she has a brain injury. It's a brain injury. This, this is part of what you have, you have to maneuver around. So it's, it's difficult. It's difficult. Kate, you uh, were on Mikey. Kate, did you have a question? Oh, I was just interested in hearing from Kathy about um, how she previously, to what extent she was involved in couples work and also um, the intersections with, you know, adult survivors of child sexual abuse um, and your work in that arena, I would love to hear about. Oh, thank you. Um, so when I was in Dan O'Leary's lab, so Dan, Dan O'Leary was a big couple couples um worker and um the shelters didn't like him <laughs> because you're not supposed to do work with couples um so you know the the directors would get me aside and they'd go cat you know you know he's you know and i'm like yeah no i know he's a-okay he's trying to trying to figure out what to do you know this is kind of the nature of the beast you sure? You sure? I'm like, yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure. Um, so the jury is still out on that. I mean, we know basically somebody's violent. You don't do a couple work. That's just that's just not a, a thing to do because you're going to get the woman hurt. My my 
childhood sexual abuse, my adult survivors of childhood sexual abuse. I did my dissertation on that. I looked at sister dyads where one sister was sexually abused and the other was not. And then how their relation, how that may have interfered with their relationship. And it, it turned out that the non-abused sibling was worse the wear um, for the incest that had occurred. So um, to the abused sister. So, so I thought that was really interesting. And siblings have always been something that, um, that I've, I've been interested in. Um, adult survivors, I've, I've been interested in their health, their health outcomes, and they run parallel. IPV and adult survivors of sexual abuse run parallel in, in um, their outcomes. I mean, the, once someone is sexually abused in childhood, you're at risk for adult relationships. So they kind of go together. I don't know if that answers it, Kate, but. We now have Hirsch and Johnny in the room. <laughs> Just gonna unlike and say hi. The duo. I can just say hi. Sorry, Kathy, I was in another meeting, so I'm no, just no happy problem, to see you Johnny. and a little late. You and her have, hear you. You, you and her have excellent attendance over the two years of this meeting. So Paul's coming up behind you. But no, we're, we to, to have men in, in part of this space is incredibly important. I think your voice, your voices need to be heard. And, um, you know, the diversity makes us stronger. So I, you know applaud your any person that wants to be in this space so we've learned so much from uh from the group and um the collaborations with eve and rachel and kathy and kate and dorothy and you catherine uh have just been invaluable um the task is okay. at times very frustrating and potentially um why are we doing this but to get uh, I think we get sustenance from seeing what other folks are doing and accomplishing. So um, it's it's easy to participate every every month. Somebody asked us. Uh, somebody asked me specifically, like, what does your task force do? And I'm like, I don't. I, we get together and collaborate all over the world. I Man, we're across twelve countries. Um, but just the connection of the people and knowing the the different threads that come out of these conversations. So it's like a lot, you know? So um, thanks for saying that. Any other questions for Kathy? Well, I think, can I pop in real quick, Catherine? This is Rachel. Um, and I just wanted to just step back again for the minute, a minute around the whole conversation of kind of survivor follow-up and thinking about if brain injuries get identified. And I think that we've seen that kind of across the board, the challenges with those follow-ups. Um, and I just think that one of the things that's really important is to how we're framing things. And, and this comes from the very kind of practice-based um, experience that I, I, I bring to this is, you know, if we have interventions that we're trying to do that aren't working for survivors or the way we're doing it, I mean, I think that's something what's so challenging about this is we just have to think totally differently about how we have to do everything. Um, I think sometimes we forget to really, really sit down and, and, and talk to survivors and not even talk to survivors, listen to survivors and ask them about how can we, you know, I guess, guess A, you know, what are, what are your priorities and how do those matter and how do we support those with you? And then, you know, if we're having this thing and it happens all the time, we decide this stuff for domestic violence survivors and they're not doing it, something's wrong with them and we got to get them to figure out how to, how to do what we want them to do, but really understanding kind of from their perspective, what is it, um, what else is going on in their lives? Um, you know, I just, I, I think that there's like, I think particularly when we're trying to intervene with people at such a, such a vulnerable time with so much going on, um, you know, I think it's very understandable that sometimes the things that seem like they're at the top of our list aren't at the top of their list. So, you know, I think that you know, my question has always been, if my stuff's not working for survivors, you know, more the, how am I, what am I doing wrong? And what do I not know? And what information do I not have um, to help kind of get to where we're at a point where this feels helpful or this feels useful or this can be done. And I think, so sometimes it's the intervention. Sometimes it's just the process 
um, how do we do that in a way that really works for them? So it's around really adjusting us, not adjusting them or, you know, there's this piece of information we could give to people. And if we told them that we're really struggling with this as an aside around the whole kind of vaccine issue in domestic violence programs um, with, you know, we really want people to get vaccinated. And there are some places where people are just not all that interested. And what kind of role do we play? How do we do that? How do we support empowerment? How do we support public health and all of those kind of things? But, um, you know, instead of trying, we're really trying to steer the conversation around like, like, what's the right thing that we need to say to convince people to do what we think is best for them and really understanding how this looks and how they're, uh, how, how, the perspective of a survivor in that situation um, and what would feel like help, that's helpful, um, what would feel supportive. Um, we do this all the time with services and, you know, people, DV programs calls, like we have these support groups that nobody's coming to, you know, what's wrong with these women that's nobody's coming to the support groups? Well, maybe there's something wrong with your support group. Um, and maybe that, and I don't know if right or wrong is the right, you know what I mean? Kind of the right framework, but however we're doing it isn't working for people. So maybe we should start with thinking about how do we need to be doing things differently? Um, and how do we really need to be asking and listening and being really open to what survivors tell us? So, um, and it's something that is hard. It's, it's, it's a struggle thinking through that, but I just did, did want to throw that in there and just do think that there's a lot of, um, just there's such huge issues with access um, that so many survivors have that, uh, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't undercount or I don't think I'm not saying anybody on, on this call is doing that, but I just think that there's, um, there's good reasons why people do things and don't do things. And if we take the time to uh, kind of stop and ask and really be open to that, um, I think that that's all the success we've had in Ohio is that we really listened first before we decided what needed to be done. I um, mean, tried best to meet the needs of what people were telling us that we needed. So Anyway, I just wanted to throw that out there. Um, it's been an evolving figuring out what that is and what that looks like. Yeah, and I, I think that self-reflection is, is so important. And, and I think that's what our survivors really kind of depend on, that, that um, we can give them space, not, not a, space and respect and acknowledgement, and then the ability to grow. You know, for us to step back and say, you know, I, I want you to grow. I don't want it to be my agenda. Because I, cause I can tell you, when women used to come into the one shelter where I work, I, I would get them in the room and, they, and they'd say, Dr. K, I, I don't want to file for divorce from my husband. Now, personally, I might think that she should get rid of him. But, and, I, and I'd say, I'd say you, don't, you don't have to do that. You know, and in this room, we're going to talk about what you want to do. And the, the agency might have an agenda, but it's, it's how to develop a clear-minded trajectory on how the woman wants to go. And, and again, figuring out how you can work within that confine uh, of the agency directives and, and the self-determination for the woman. Well, and I think, Kathy, it's even more complicated because I, you know, I think that there's a lot of you know, I always say when I do my training is most domestic violence programs will say, oh, no, we don't tell you what to do. We believe in self-empowerment. We believe in you making your own decisions. And it's not like anybody, anybody ever said to them, like, this is what you're supposed to do next. But that comes through very clear, doesn't it? Because <laughs> people are with you saying, please don't tell anybody. But like, and again, it wasn't that somebody sat them down and was like, all right, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to get divorced. And then we're going to do this. And then we're going to do that. Um, so Establish I think that, custody, go get mm -hmm. an OP. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's an agenda. It's an agenda. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I think, you know, there's so many complications for the, for the woman um, emotionally, um, you know, she, now she's homeless. Uh, she may be grieving about the relationship and grieving the fact that somebody that she really loved just beat the crap out of her. I mean, that's crazy. That's really crazy. And so there's that mourning that has to go on. Um, but that's kind of not the agenda in, in a lot of places. I wouldn't say all but in a lot of places. There, there is one aspect that, that hasn't been really discussed and I think is important, and that is in identifying the various components of the concussion or the brain injury, 
since there are so many different manifestations, whether it's neurocognitive or oculomotor or vestibular, in identifying one of the personalized approaches to the head injury, by making that one symptom or sign better, it gives the victim an opportunity to know that it doesn't have to be this way. And one of the things we've learned through the, the law enforcement and police officers and advocates talking to the victim at the point of incident, when they see the victim wearing sunglasses, it used to be they thought they were hiding their, you know, their eyes from drugs or whatever. And when we pointed out to them that it could be photophobia and just identifying one or two small things that are bothering the victim that they didn't appreciate might have been related to the head blow can be the start of getting them to accept more treatment and more therapy, not being able to get on a bus, not filling out an application for a job. These are very simple things that if they're approached on a personal basis by engaging the victim in what their symptom is, sometimes can be a help. It isn't the cure-all, but it's a start as opposed to trying to say, leave your husband. I think that that's um, a very important point to make because I think one of the critical elements of like following brain injury is just like the lack of self-awareness and what is going on. And then you blame yourself for things that you need treatment or rehab or guidance for. And whether it's things about like memory or executive dysfunction or disorganization or structuring yourself or even controlling your emotions, um, you know, or impulsivity or just how you're handling yourself that's often a direct you know, result of the brain injury and the concussion that you don't have control over and you feel like you should. And so that can lead to self-deprecation you know, and a lot of other issues. So I think um, making sure that that diagnosis and evaluation you know, is there can help these women like identify you know, what's going on and help to manage it. Exactly, one of, the, one of the real shocks when Johnny and I and one of our uh, neuropsychologist colleagues first had a focus group with a group at the shelter and sat around the room. And our purpose was to listen, not to talk and just allow them to tell us what they experienced. When we found that a significant number couldn't sleep at night because of nightmares and horrors and anxiety, which created a whole circle of problems. And our, our colleague just taught in one session one of the women how to breathe. He gave her some exercises of how to breathe to relieve her anxiety. And it was so unbelievable to us that we had never even thought about the fact that the injury was related uh, to the assault, but the assault then led her to have recurring nightmares. And if a person can't sleep, then how do they attack all these other issues that are bothering them? Or, or they wind up sleeping all day and then the shelter personnel get really annoyed. You know, you got to get up and take care of your kid. Well, if they've been up all night because they can't sleep, yeah, so it's. We had a great um, speaker last Thursday on the casual conversations on sleep. Um, Rachel Rowe, um, sleep and then the effect on the endocrine system after TBI. If anybody's interested in sleep, I'll probably post that later today. Um, Kathy, it's been so great. We have about six minutes left. I know, um, Gwen, you had a question for the group. If you can condense the question into like two minutes, we could maybe give you a response or next month if you'd like to present it in a, a larger framework. Um, what would you like to do, Gwen? Sure, just, just a couple of seconds. I don't really need much time, but um, we are working on a grant in New Mexico to develop services or some kind of consultation for providers of healthcare who could work with domestic violence victims who have TBI. Um, we have a problem in that we have such a rural state. It's rural frontier. There's 23 tribal nations. There really are not um, services in all of these areas. If you're not in Albuquerque, it's really difficult to get any help. So I'm working with um, Dr. Mark Pedrotti. He is with the Brain, Brain Injury Alliance of New Mexico. We've been doing trainings. We've been doing um, 
how to screen. And now we have to do something about getting consultation or services to the rest, to the whole rest of the state outside of Albuquerque. So I um, had put that in the chat and I'm so happy. I got, I got responses from people that are willing to help. And so I'm gonna be in contact with those people. I really appreciate it. Catherine, I wanna to respond to Gwen's comments by asking whether or not we've had a discussion on this task force with regards to telemedicine in working with the specific population. And uh, now that we're a year into essentially 100% telemedicine, are there unique challenges and opportunities, especially for Gwen, where um, telemedicine may be at least the first or intermittent approach? I don't have any experience. So I'm well, I think Kathy, can, Kathy and I were speaking about that right before we, we went live. Um, okay. Kathy, you yeah. want to comment on whether telemedicine is the answer? I, I think certainly at the beginning, um, our, our school, our university is really just bursting at the seams with um, telehealth and telemedicine. Um, in, in fact, we just put together a course for the uh, medical students on, on telehealth um, and how to deliver it. And to focus it for brain injury, I think would, would be a fantastic idea. The, I think the issue, the immediate issue that I think you're gonna have is how do you get Wi-Fi services in rural communities? And then how do you get people with startups with um, um, the equipment? But I, but I can also tell you that a colleague of mine in the School of Social Welfare, she just wrote a grant and they got oodles of money for phones so that people could be able to call in. So the money is out there. Uh, I think it's just how creative you can be to, to scramble to get it. Right, and we've been working with uh, this foundation who has funded us for two years for doing the training and the screening. So we are gonna proceed with hopefully working with them. That's good, that's really good. I... And, and just a note on the, um, you know, the pandemic has had this side of it that really is, I think, an opportunity. And that is, we have been able to train so many more people doing it online than we could have doing it in person. Right. While you don't get that personal interaction, um, it's just opened up things around the state that wouldn't have happened before. So Gwen, you're in the process of applying for this grant? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. It will be for 2022. Okay, so if you need help, let me know. Thank you so much. Thank you, so everyone. It's a, it's a very collaborative group. So, um, you know, and I gotta say, I, I came from the sports concussion space and it's, it's not. It, it, I have found the warmest, most collaborative people that help each other out and, and stand on each other's shoulders and build each other up. So uh, it, it just, it's, it's a, a warmer space in the sports world, which I always find kind of interesting. So thank you, Kathy, for um, coming on and having this conversation. And uh, Rachel, Eve, uh, Kathy, Angela, Lynn, and I, thank you. Um, if you um, have any questions or want to contact anybody, um, our directory is now almost 400 people. Um, it's on the <laughs> intern list to try to... Uh, we don't want to give out uh, everybody's email addresses, but we're trying to come up with a way that we can build a directory. But thank you all. And uh, thank you, Kelly and Paul and uh, Amanda, Maggie, Kent. Uh, Hope is taking notes uh, for us all. And um, Tracy, Monique, Yolanda, Brittany, Hirsch and Samantha Marlene. I think I got everybody. So thank you guys today for being there. Um, Bye everybody. Yeah. Everyone I'm so glad great. they didn't make noise doing my road. So. Yeah, and are we a fun group? <laughs> Absolutely. Bye, Bye everybody. everybody. Take care. <laughs> See you next month. Bye-bye.